So good evening and uh, good morning, wherever you are uh, joining us from. Um, it is, I'm Sarosh Anklesarya and uh, it is an absolute honor for me to introduce our speaker for today's uh, Poche Conversations, uh, Professor Dilip Takuna. Uh, Dilip is co-director of the R Risk and Resilience Master in Design Studies at the Graduate School of Design, Harvard University and an adjunct professor at the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, Columbia University. Um, through various design projects, a lifelong immersion in teaching and through four groundbreaking books with his partner, Anuradha Mathur, uh, Dilip has made fundamental contributions to understand and to destabilize how we as designers relate to water. Each of these books is simultaneously a rigorous treatise in landscape thinking, as well as a work of intense beauty and art. I really, for those of you who are not familiar with the books, absolutely, please get a hold of them. Uh, Mississippi Floods, Designing a Shifting Landscape in 2001, Deccan Traverses, The Making of Bangalore's Terrain in 2006, Soak Mumbai in, in an Estuary, 2009, and design in the terrain of water 2014. His lecture today, Water to Wetness, Yamuna and Ganga as Rain Rather Than Rivers, will draw from his most recent book, The Invention of Rivers, Alexander's Eye and Ganga's Descent, which traces the historical roots of our understandings, uh, of our misunderstandings, I should say, about rivers, rain, evaporation, inundation, and all other states of the condition of wetness. It challenges the three most fundamental parameters that define a river, its source, its course, and its floodplain, making rain rather than rivers the main protagonist of wetness. In 2017, Mathur and Dakuna launched Ocean of Wetness, a design platform that seeks to, stimul to stimu situate, excuse me, the past, present, and future of habitation in a ubiquitous wetness rather than on um, a land water surface. Mathur and Dakuna received a Pew Fellowship grant in recognition of their collaborative work that imagines new possibilities for design of the built environment and challenges the lines separating water and land, urban and rural, formal and informal environments. Please join me in welcoming Dilip Dakuna. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Sarosh. Uh, very generous introduction. Um, you know, I'm, I must, uh, I mean, I appreciate your, your invitation very much and, uh, and the possibility of, uh, of, speaking, of speaking to this studio and particularly your challenge um, in, uh, in dealing with, uh, with, with a project in, in Delhi. Although I question the cityness of, of Delhi, and, uh, and I hope that'll, that'll come out. But I did uh, spend a little time uh, listening to the introduction that was given by, by the faculty and uh, enjoyed it very much. And, but I wanted to make one point that uh, what I took away from uh, Professor Chaya's uh, uh, introductory words um, was, was this, I think the challenge, the challenge to see ourselves as, um, you know, as inhabitants of, of, of ground alongside other inhabitants. And, and I, I mean, I came away with that, uh, with that uh, challenge and it is a tall one, you know, for designers uh, to see ourselves uh, in a playing field uh, along with, uh, with other beings you know, we're talking about plants, we're talking about animals, we're talking about uh, various uh, species and, uh, and our own kind, of course. Um, but uh, the question I want to raise today is the inhabitant of what? Of what? Um, I mean, Sudipto's presentation that followed was very much a presentation on Delhi and the conversation that followed that was very much a presentation on Delhi. And, um, and the idea that Delhi is a city uh, is, is something that, that I want to question because a city comes with a surface and I want to question the very idea of a geographic surface that we take for granted to be the ground of habitation. So without much ado, I think I will, I will present the thesis. I want to take you down to a place 
uh, a little further along uh, the Ganges. Yes, but I would like to begin with this uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful drawing uh, that might situate us uh, in uh, not just uh, not just geographically but historically. This is a 1647 drawing by uh, Sadiq Isfahani um, in uh, Jaunpur in uh, near Lucknow, I guess, on the Gomti. Um, with a wonderful, uh, wonderful map uh, of the Yamuna and Ganga that you see, you know, ending up, of course, in the in the Bay of Bay of Bengal. Um, this is a this is a map by by uh, a priest, a Jesuit priest, uh, in the in the year 1780s, I guess, when he traveled down from Agra uh, to Calcutta, um, and uh, and you can see Agra. Is there, there's no Delhi up there, so this is the late 1700s. Uh, but um, but uh, this, I want to take you to where where he went to some extent, and that is Banaras, uh, of course, which we call Baranasi today. Um, that's his drawing on the top. Uh, you know, on the top, it's his uh, it's his uh, one of the first panoramas, river panoramas uh, that were that was drawn. And of course, you can see all the crucifixes on uh, on the temple tops and the and the strange drawing uh, that of willful of willful seeing, as it were, you know, of of a place. And then, of course, uh, below it, you see a more uh, indigenous production uh, of a similar perspective. But this idea of a city on a river is something that uh, I notice comes across very much when there's a river in proximity automatically the city is seen as a city on the river, you know, and, um, and, and that is something with a long history. But over here, it, it, there is a particular uh, issue that comes, to, that comes, uh, that comes up, and uh, uh, that is of, of great significance, I would think, but we don't spend, spend much time uh, following it. So you're all familiar with Varanasi. I mean, it was, you know, Paintings were produced by William Hodges, you know, to James Princep in the, you know, following that map by, by, uh, by Tiefenthaler. Uh, and today, of course, the riverfront is, of course, I mean, as the, as the word suggests, the front of the city, you know. And so it's the place that we, that we design for. You design a city on a river and you design it with a front to a river. So in other words, there's a face. And that means that there is a backside, you know, when there's a front side, you know, and this, this orientation, this orientation of, of, uh, of, of the river is a significant, uh, you know, sort of attribute. And you cannot escape it, as you yourselves are, are finding with the Yamuna and Delhi, you know, so, but here there is something else that goes on. What you see on the left is high waters, images that we took when we were there in July of 2014, I believe it was, uh, the years are collapsing in my mind. And on the right are, uh, are images that we took in December uh, of uh, 2018 and uh, 19. Um, and you can see from here, actually, the rise in the water is between 40 and 50 feet. That temple is completely under, the temple that you see, this temple over here, is completely submerged over here. This over here, this, you know, this uh, facade that you see over here of the building is that over there. So you see this whole emergence actually of this wonderful, you know, uh, talao over here. So this uh, difference of 40 feet, what happens actually with it? This is what happens. You get, you get a massive collection of mud in these temples you know, that, uh, that come to this level of this, of this line, at least, at least, you know, and so, so water here is entering, you know, if you've been to this ghat, the Dashashmeda ghat, you will find that, that uh, you know, the waters come right up there. I have, I have a lot of these images because I've been in this, in this place and all, you know, in, uh, in multiple seasons. Um, but this is one of the best kept secrets of, uh, of Benares. We just wash away the, wash away the mud every October, you know, to, uh, to clear a city for the tourist or to create a city that lives up to its name 
as a city on a river. So where is this mud coming from and how is this water rising to this extent? So I looked, looked up you know, certain historical documents and the possibility that, uh, that at one time, at one time, and this is from excavations that you see on the left over here, archeological ex excavations that were done in the 1950s and 60s uh, that go down, that go down to this extent in, eight, in 800, 600 BC, in BC, you find that the level of settlement, and this is excavations at A over here, you know, that is, I mean, in, in a place called Rajgat, if you're familiar with, uh, if you're familiar with Varanasi. Uh, and the drawing that you see here on the right is a drawing by James Princep in 1820s, in 1820s, when he was, the, when he was working for the, for the East India Company over here, who went on, of course, to do those paintings that you saw earlier and uh, some amazing work, but also the first map, city map of Varanasi. He is one man probably singularly responsible uh, after Tiefenthaler for turning the city to the river. But, but what, you, what you have over here, this section that he drew at B, you can see the alluvial bluff, the water, he had the water high mark over here. The water comes up till at least here now. So it rises to 40 to 50 feet. And so in a matter of, a matter of 200, I mean 100, 150, 200 years, it has gone up already. So, but what does this say? If I take the excavations down to this level, people lived at the low water mark of the Ganges. So I asked an archeologist, how is this possible? How have people lived at this level 2000 years ago if water rose 40 feet above them with a monsoon? She, told, she tells me, and this, and this really speaks to our cognitive dissonance. Um, she tells me they built levees. I said, would you build a levee in a monsoon climate? You will drown behind it. And how will you build a levee 2000 years ago to a height of 40 to 50 feet, which is what the Mississippi is bound by today. Having started 200 years ago at four feet to five feet, it's now you know, 40 feet. How could people here build a levee 40 feet high in that time? So something is wrong over here. What I suggest is this, the river never rose 20, I mean, uh, 2000 years ago because there was no river. What there was, was a vast system of holdings across the continent. So you had forests that held rain, you had jungles that held rain, you had the soil that held rain, you had, you had tanks and talaos like you see over here on the top that were behind, who are now considered the backside of, of, of Varanasi. So these tanks are now all abandoned. But India, if you will, where was, a, was a ground of holding systems and holding systems that were then tackled right through, of course, you know, the millennia, two millennia, but was accelerated by the British. And so this is what, this is what Princep did when he was in Varanasi in 1820s. He drained the tanks to the river by building these channels. So these are, these are some of his drawings actually from the British Library of a channel that is draining this Machadori uh, Talao. And so now the tanks, most of them drained to the city, basically led to rivers becoming drains. So this is the model that we, that we live by. Actually, we, we live by this model of rivers, of rivers draining the land. And we teach our children that rivers drain the land. But rivers, I want to su suggest, are a construction, are an invention, are a product of design. Design of a terrain that was wetness and that held rain wherever it fell. And so the water did not rise in any place more than a foot or two feet. And people were able to live in a field-like situation rather than in cities on rivers. So the whole myth actually of this being an ancient city, et cetera, et cetera, is to some extent suspect, uh, is suspect. I mean, there was a completely different mode of habitation at one time because there was a different ground of habitation. It was a milieu of wetness. So I wanna, I wanna take you through you know, a journey that I have constituted that, uh, that speaks actually to the difference between, between two grounds of habitation. 
India, and I call them India and Sindhu for a reason, and I will come to that in a, in a, in a second. Life begins with a monsoon. And I'm not talking only about, about South Asia, I'm talking about, about parts of Africa, I'm talking about Southeast Asia, et cetera. Life begins with the monsoon. And if you're familiar with the monsoon, and, I, and I'm referring particularly to the Southwest monsoon, you know, it is, it is a tremendous amount of, of rain that falls between, uh, between June and September. It is received, it is received two ways, two ways. One is in a field of wetness. When the rain falls, it just, it replenishes a wetness that extends from clouds to aquifers. So people inhabit this thickness. In this world, there is nothing like dryness. There is only wetness of various degrees. So when I talk about a desert, I'm talking about less wet than the sea. The sea is more wet. So it's a relative, it's a relative measure actually of a, of, a, of a milieu of habitation. Now this wetness, you know, soaks, it seeps, it, it is held, it is held in plants, it is held in vegetation, it's held in soil, it is held in the air, you know? And so we respect this, this, um, this sense of wetness everywhere. It's ubiquitous and you design with it. This is what you, you know, you act, begin to appreciate. You begin to appreciate walls that hold wetness. You begin to a ground that holds wetness. You, you, you look at veg, vegetation that holds wetness. So today we are planting trees for climate change. I plant trees to hold wetness, you know? And, and so there are different degrees that you see across, across um, you know, and I call this Sindhu, you know, not, you know, because Sindhu, as you all probably know, you know, means ocean. But no one has been able to explain, you know, why it was used for the river Indus. Now, you know, I mean, and, and so we often trace it to, you know, the river Indus, and that is erroneous. Sindhu, I suggest, is from Indu. Indu meaning raindrop, raindrop. So it's an ocean of rain as opposed to Sagar, which is the ocean of the sea, uh, saltwater ocean. So this ocean is not a geographic concept. Ocean is a hydrologic phenomenon. In the second paradigm, the second ground of habitation, we see rain of the monsoon falling from clouds to an earth surface. So we see it falling to a surface and then draining of the surface into, into rivers and then rivers to the sea, and then the sea evaporates and comes back again to, you know, with the, in the convection cycle to, uh, to create rain. That is what we are taught, you know. But in this model, this is the ground of habitation that we as architects often work with. I mean, or assume actually as existing. I call this India. So this is India. And I want to suggest that it was introduced 2000 years ago in, a, in an act of geographic colonization that preceded the current, uh, you know, the, I should say the erstwhile co the colonization by the European nations. This was very much an academic construction that came with Alexander, you know, whom we call Alexander the Great. And this is the ground that we then have. It's a ground of India. And, uh, and India that has taken various forms from, from what we call uh, you know, early primitive uh, articulations of Ptolemy that you see on the top left, um, attributed to him, second, lived in the second century uh, AD, uh, down to uh, what we, you know, the British Empire, and then, uh, and then of course, Google today, uh, you know, uh, satellite projections. Um, so we have basically Sindhu and India. India is a river landscape, a surface by design. What you have on the left is Sindhu, an ocean of rain, a ubiquitous wetness. So on the right side, you have, you have a, a mode of designing by separation. You separate land and water. On the, right, on the left side over here, you have, you have ubiquitous wetness that you must negotiate. So you're negotiating your, your, your presence as opposed to separating uh, the, the conditions that, uh, that, that you look at, literally. Okay. So the question I ask is, how is India designed? You know, with the act of separation and what I want to suggest, I mean, a surface, a line, and the choice of a moment. And I'll just take you this, to this very quickly. 
A surface was posited, and I won't go into the details of this. My, you know, our forthcoming book, uh, Ocean of Rain, is going to deal with this, uh, with this uh, articulation, and and how uh, designers have come to accept what is really a work of design that we have lost our ability to question because it is so taken for granted. But you posit a surface that separates waters that fall from above and waters that come from below. You posit a surface, so it's it's not something that you take for granted. You posit it as an actor, and that is what most surveyors do. The first thing they do is to, you know, posit a surface that they then begin to articulate. So this surface, then, once you know you you assert it, you begin to see that it holds an earth interior below and an exterior atmosphere above. So what you have done now with this act of separation, you have created an inside and an outside. It's very much what architects do with a building. You know, a building actually is an act of separation that separates an inside from an outside. And then after that, you design the skin of the building, you know, with, you know, with openings, with, uh, with uh, insulations, uh, you know, and form, you give it form, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that is exactly what we did with the earth. Once you created an interior, you called it earth, and then you, you called it, you just remember that at this time, you had no conception of a planet. I'm talking 2000 years ago when this was actually done, 2500 years ago, when this was asserted, it was asserted in the condition actually in which, you know, Thales, who is the father of science, actually, you know, sort of inhabited in, uh, in Miletus. Once you, once you make the separation, then you make a second separation. You, you, of, and I'm talking about earth and you know, inside and outside, you make a second separation on the surface between land and water. And this, you use a line. So the surface, you must remember, is a skin. I mean, if you think of, if you think of uh, uh, Euclid's definition, it has no depth. And the same thing with the line, a line has no thickness. It has no breadth. It has only length. And so with that line, you separate and you create water and land. So with that line, I'm able to, I'm able to, you know, to, to separate the sea with a coastline from land. I mean, this drawing is by, by John McClure, the down of the west coast of India. And then you know, on the right is a, is a drawing by James Rennell, where you, where you actually create a river by drawing a line that contains water to a place and creates what you call dry land or drained land. And this, I mean, if you read some of his, uh, some of his log books, you will see how difficult he, he found this, you know, uh, he, uh, he found doing this in the Sundarbans, you know, where he literally had to create a line with embankments in order to separate land from water in a delta, in a delta situation. But the line on the right, this line, we actually granted much more agency Besides separating, it also contains water to a river. It contains water to a flow, and then it calibrates a flow. So without that line, we wouldn't be able to see a beginning and an end, or a before and an after. A line is what, what allows you to have a reference for a flow. So if you go back and read someone like Heraclitus, you know, who said, you know, because there's his writings are in the writings of other, other philosophers, you know, who said that you cannot step into the same river twice for water is ever flowing. He was asking you to step across this line. So this line was already in place when he lived, you know, in 500, 500 BC, you know. So this is a design assertion that I, I, I put a line down and I say water and land. That line, because it has no thickness, disappears. So today, you know, while we call it a coastline and it comes into presence only when sea level rises, you know, and, and in the case of flood, you know, it, uh, the, river, the river line comes into, comes into presence as it were. Otherwise, you take this line for granted. You just have a river bank. People just talk about a river bank like as if it's a natural, it's a natural thing and you settle on a river bank because now you have contained water behind a line. So this act of, of separation with a line that then turns invisible turns invisible because it has no, no thickness, you know, so you lose that mediating power of the line and you just have land and water. You don't have, you don't have anything you know, in between. So now the, you know, ecologists are at pains to talk about an intermediate zone, a riparian zone between land and water, but that is merely the thickening of a line. So for me, flood is not a natural phenomenon. Flood is the water crossing a line that I have drawn. It is the product of design. 
So for some, for an ecologist to tell me that flood is natural just doesn't, just doesn't ring true. It is part, I would think, of a larger mischief that science has hidden from, critical, from a critical view. Uh, and we need to question it today. How can flood be a natural phenomenon? And even if we talk about flood and admit that it is, that it is an, uh, you know, it has human causes today, we still, we still believe that the Nile, for example, flooded. We teach our children that floods created, you know, created high waters that then led to civilizations and cities. Um, now, this is, a, this is a myth construction, and it's a construction based on, on I would think, uh, an articulation, a human articulation of, of, uh, of ground, you know, of, of land and, and water. So once you have a surface, once you have a line, you have a, a, you, you have a surface that can be, can be then taken command of, as it were, and designed with what we now call a skyline. You know, a skyline where you, you, know, you have buildings and you have water in, 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 in contained and, you know, and so on and, and so forth. So this has been 2,500 years in the making in, in, terms, of, in terms of its, its, uh, its uh, um, you know, sort of development, if you will. Uh, but uh, but you know when when people now talk about talk about uh, a certain, you know, let me let me just continue uh, with this. So this is you see this sort of progression, you know, from the positing of a line to the articulation the articulation of of a surface that we now take for granted as uh, as the ground of habitation. Um, now when I talk about it, so that is about the surface and the line as agencies of design. Here here I'm talking about now the choice of time. Uh, you're all familiar with the hydrologic cycle because you've all probably drawn it as children that you see on the left over here, a collection from, from Rishi Valley School um, that, uh, that I, I managed to, to collect um, some, remarkable, some remarkable representations of a child's imagination uh, of how water circulates. And it's incredible how the whole world actually learns this, uh, the water cycle, you know, between the fifth grade and the sixth grade. You know, and so here you have a, a much more complex drawing in the middle of uh, the first drawing of the hydrologic cycle by Robert Houghton in uh, 1931, I think was the date, um, in which you see actually four, uh, four, um, uh, real, four segments. You know, one is precipitation, this is flow formation, this is evaporation, and this is cloud formation on the top. So we learned that, I mean, as Paul Clay on the right side shows it, there are four four moments in time. Now, why does this matter? You know, when you put this in wetness, what you create over here is a moment, a moment of reality. So a surveyor, when a surveyor goes out, they wait for the rain to stop. They wait for the, they, they don't look for evaporation. They wait for the clouds to pass if they're using, if they're using a, you know, a satellite imagery. You know? And then they have a surface. And in that moment, we have created reality. So in that moment, you have properties marked, you have maps drawn, you have infrastructure designed, you have a history written. So even when you read history, for example, and for, if I to take Alexander, you think about Alexander coming in a fair weather moment, and then rain comes in as a visitor. So what you have over here is moments of ephemerality. So with this one choice of moment, where we've chosen a moment of reality, we have also constructed moments of ephemerality, we've constructed visitors. So now we have made rivers resident, we have made lakes resident, and we have made evaporation, we have made clouds, we have made dew, we have made rain into visitors. So it's like today, the resident holding, holding sway over the visitor. So the visitor becomes a migrant, you know, and so we talk about rain as coming and going. We don't talk about rain as something that we live with. We talk about it as someone that visits us and passes on and passes by. Yeah? And today it has increasingly become an unwanted visitor, you know, in, particularly in India, you know, where you fear floods that are brought by rain. So we don't blame rivers and the line for flood, we blame rain for flood, which is a remarkable turnaround, you know, and, uh, and uh, a revealing of the colonized mind. So here you have uh, the extension of this moment which has taken over our living. So today we design air conditioned environments to keep humidity out. We design glass surfaces to keep, to keep water out. 
you know, we, we do everything actually to, to control an environment in which, in which there is no wetness. In the, no wetness, or if wetness of rain falls, we drain it off as fast as possible, as fast as possible. So we talk about um, impermeable surfaces today, you know, that have, that have just, you know, uh, increased uh, in area actually across, across the earth, you yeah? know, which then, of course, you know, I would say tends to exaggerate the blaming uh, our blame on rain because you know somehow we feel that it's always it's always rain then that does not drain even though we have created the impermeable surface so in this moment we find maps are drawn so we we actually we could think of a map a map is a fair weather landscape it's a river landscape that we have constituted you know it's not a realm of wetness we have cleared out wetness in order to in order to frame this moment to frame this moment and to frame reality in this moment so we Design. I mean, all our properties come from this, uh, come from these, uh, from these maps. And of course, we don't, we don't do maps in this kind of a mode. This is, of course, just to appreciate, you know, as a view from space. What we do is we clear the clouds, and so we construct a map by various moments. And that the moment, you know, I mean, I would say various moments. It's a single moment, but at various times when there is no clouds, we we take pictures and then you and then you assemble, you assemble it into the into the map. So the map is a moment but it's a constituted moment, <coughs> excuse me. So you have then an India that emerges now in a moment of time with a drawn line, with a drawn line, and of course, with the positing of a surface, you know? So we always see rain now as falling to a surface and draining off by these red lines that you see over here. So I take this back, I cannot go into this detail, but my book actually covers this as uh, Sarosh mentioned, uh, the invention of rivers. Uh, attributes this film. Alexander is one of the, you know, is an educated conqueror. His, uh, and, uh, you know, his story is too long to tell. But uh, here I just wanted to point out his route coming to India behind all the last frontiers of the monsoon. So he comes from Egypt, comes from Egypt, he goes from, he starts from Athens, I mean, uh, starts from, uh, from Greece uh, via Athens and, and other places, and then down to, to Egypt, and then he comes down he marches across, you know, and I'm talking 320 BC, and he's the first monarch to travel with a world map. And then he enters through the, the Hindu Kush uh, mountains and the passes in the, in the mountains. And this is where on the right side, you see my, my re-representation of these last frontiers. So he is in the rain shadow. And then he comes across over here into, into India, you know, and then he, what he meets, he meets is this, a profuse wetness. A wetness that he's never seen before, and for a moment he thinks he's in. He's, he thinks he's 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 reached the source of the Nile, which was of course another, um, you know, uh, enterprise that they had uh, constructed. Where does all this water come from? And uh, he thought he was there for a while until until someone told him, I guess, that he wasn't. But he wanted then to go on to the Ganges and then could not because this was his men just rebelled. I know we, you know, they say that he you know, that he was homesick and uh, or that the men were homesick and they mutinied and all that. But, you know, there is one historian that mentions rain for 70 days, it rained. And when it rains, you don't have a surface. You don't have a surface that you can articulate. It's basically water everywhere. It's wetness everywhere. And, it's, and they just could not deal with it. So they had to turn back and they turned back. So I would like to think that, uh, that uh, Alexander was defeated by rain, a man who was intent on drawing a river landscape and reaching the ends of the earth, because he saw it as, you know, as a, as, as a, a flat surface actually that had an end to the ocean. And he wanted to reach that, reach that ocean and conquer all the land around, I mean, in it, in that, in that sort of island-like nature that he believed the world was, um, he was defeated by, he was defeated by rain. But ultimately, this is what his legacy is. His legacy is his eye. His eye and the articulation of a surface, um, he seeded it and it evolved into what we see now, you know, and what we take for granted to be our ground. Um, I wanted to just, you know, focus on one because that is what I've sort of focused on and that is Ganga River. I make a difference between Ganges and Alexander was one of the first people to use the word Ganges, you know, and, um, and, uh, but what he saw was a river. Ganges is a river, Ganga is rain. So today, even though we use the word Ganga for the Ganges, 
uh, to signify a, a river, I question that, you know, and um, this is something that, uh, that uh, we, can, we can talk further about. But what has happened is that if we talk about the Sundarbans and you can see the, the evolution of maps, even though these maps are recent, what they're made from a, from a, from a mangrove swamp that, uh, that gradually built in an estuary, we have made it into a river delta. So this is the Bengal estuary. It is not a delta. And, and if, you think about, if you think about this as being the wet, the wet surface at one time has become this articulated ground whereby you have actually held land to a place in islands and uh, constituted islands in a, in a place of just wet mud and humidity and profound you know, uh, wetness from clouds to aquifers, we have constructed a delta, an articulated delta. And then of course you see here, beginning with Tiefenthaler, I mean, and, sorry, much before Tiefenthaler, the articulation of the Ganges River in the plains. Uh, and this, you know, we have controlled, we have basically created an item by which we can control water. So this whole, uh, you know, uh, evolution then of the canal systems, et cetera, et cetera, comes from, you know, not the engineering of a river, but the design of a river in order to be, in order to engineer water. And then we have taken the Ganges into the mountains. They have traced the Ganges all the way up. I mean, what you see on the bottom here is a drawing by, uh, by a geographer, a German, German geographer of the, of the elevation of the Himalayas in 1840s. Um, and uh, the drawing on the top is one of the early drawings of Tibet. I mean, as a, as a source of, of seven, of seven uh, or, or more rivers. I mean, it's a remarkable high ground. I mean, we are talking about Tibet, uh, which is an average, of, uh, uh, average height um, that is the equivalent of Mont Blanc, the highest mountain in Europe. So this was considered to be a deformation of the earth by Europeans uh, for a long while. And, uh, and from here, rivers emerged. In fact, there are stories of Columbus actually wanting to reach Tibet when he was talking about, about India, because that was the place of gold, et cetera, that came down, uh, came down the Ganges uh, River. So while he wanted to get to the Ganges, it was more the source that he was interested in, and this mountain where he thought was paradise, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so what you have now is a creation of, 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 the, of, the, of a river uh, that uh, has you know, sort of been embraced by, by everybody. Uh, you know, as the spine of a civilization, and uh, and and unfortunately now a drain of of settlement because you know you teach people, you teach children that you know rivers drain the land, river drain the land, and they become drains, and that's what we have now a nightmare, a nightmare situation whereby rivers are both our spines of civilization and our bugbear, uh, if you will, of of civilization. We have created an object that can be controlled. And, uh, and this thing, so the Ganga Canal, the whole uh, project uh, that was undertaken by the British came from ability now to, to move a controlled uh, water system. Um, and this, of course, I got in Delhi, you know, from Delhi school. As I passed by, I saw this light flashing and here it read, save, save a life, say, you know, I mean, adopt a tree, adopt an animal, adopt a being, adopt a river, you know? And so we have come to accept rivers as, as natural things that we that we uh, that we that we live with and that we can adopt and then of course you have the kumela you know that uh, that believes now that that has a water contained that can be venerated now i would argue that the, that there are many stories that you hear of ganga being being you know being uncontained and uh, and being uh, worshiped across across india but it is always this ganga that takes precedence so i should say the ganges river that, uh, that takes precedence over all other, other rivers. So if you read Diana Ek, she makes much actually of this, of this river as an object of, of, uh, of veneration and looking at a goddess in the, in the form of a river. And that is what I find very interesting. How is a goddess contained between two lines if it is an infinite being? So what you have is a goddess that is revolting against this framing. And uh, you see the, the Himalayan tsunami of 2013 in which we were, we got caught in it. My daughter was 13 years old and uh, uh, we, were, we were on our way back from Gangotri and, we, and the mountains started falling around us in, uh, in June of 2013. And it's incredible actually that, um, that we have actually dammed the Bhagirathi, you know, because we've, 
we believe that uh, you know you have something that you can control the siltation of that is going to see the end of that dam in a very short in a very short while and of course we've created a, a mess of pollution etc and what is interesting in the last in the bottom in the bottom line is how we blame rain when it rained hell on paradise when we, when you know you talk about the devil and the and the and the sea we're caught between the monsoon as the devil you know i mean our rain a, a whole rain culture has made rain an enemy how is that possible and we have done it actually post independence more than the british did it so so there's something obviously very wrong with the way in which we are looking so to come back then to the two grounds of design one india the other sindhu in india you have a land water situation you have a singularity and hierarchy of rivers which are now extended into buildings through pipes and faucets to fields through deserts to you know to uh, we we have taken it in in a can i mean today they are building rivers where there were no rivers i mean and so you you're creating river fronts i mean you uh, yeah, i'm going to be part of a conversation on bangladesh uh, on dhaka uh, and and the heritage and i find that over there you are talking about about people who want to make the the buri ganga uh, river front into the thames river front i have been in conversations in bangalore where i've heard engineers speaking and politicians speaking about about making uh, literally you know uh, what is what has become a sewage stream uh, for the exit of bangalore sewage they want to clean it and make it into a river so that bangalore has a river front uh, that is the equivalent of thames they even talk about the wheel i've been in calcutta where the the chief minister is talking about the hugli being redesigned for its river front and the river front to be modeled on the thames river you know with the london eye etc you know so i mean what have we come to um and then so you know, cuz you talk about it as draining the land and you talk about this is i mean what i what i talk about as design as separate by separation on the you know on the right side on the on the right side you have sindhu and ocean of rain a ubiquitous wetness a multiplicity and autonomy of the rain drop you know and and a uh, holding inspires holding so wetness does not flow right? wetness holds you know it osmotes it seeps it 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 soaks it evaporates it condenses it sublimates etc you know and here designed by negotiation so very different modes of design all of our history of architecture is on the left frankly you know and uh, on on the right you may even question the very notion of history as a past that gathers in some form over here you have much more of what is a now rather than you know a gathering of the past in the present rather than a history that remains you know as a linear structuring on a on a fair weather landscape this i just put in to give you a sense of what it might mean uh, to to uh, distinguish two infrastructures so so on the left you have a river infrastructure that when you separate land from water you're forced to build embankments and levees in order to contain that water to into to a channel on the right side you have wetness that rises and falls and you build on mounds and i want to suggest that this is another reading of the janapad a janapad is a foothold and the foothold of the people you know in wetness and so you lived always on a gradient today you would find this very much on the in the western ghats still and you find it in some parts of the of the footage but this idea that you hold rain you know which we now sort of almost derogatorily talk about as rain rain irrigation uh, you talk about you talk about rain as rising and falling not flowing and so you talk about gathering in terraces you talk about holding it in you know as far as possible in your in your planting of rice in your planting of other other you know uh, flora etc you know but that is about that is about holding uh, in falling so the idea that you can have discrete you can have discrete fields of uh, of settlements in a in an open open uh, uh, field of wetness is very different from from settling on a river and creating a river front that separates land you know and on a surface that separates land from water so two very different infrastructures two very different grounds of of design uh, so we are working on this ocean of rain now what it really means to design with wetness what it really means to negotiate rather than separate um so we are working with uh, from from varanasi we are we are going to the east west north south this is a little glimpse of an excerpt Uh, that we are exhibiting in germany as part of bruno latour's um, uh, uh, exhibition called uh, critical zones 
um, where we have made a small contribution and uh, and uh, these are some of the drawings where we have just taken one part and our, our work on Varanasi where we looked at uh, four elements uh, in Varanasi in this case we've looked at more but uh, but what it means to see to see experience something you know like a raindrop you experience the streets of Varanasi in this sense and then you move toward India where you are extracting objects for classification schemes and articulation of a surface and you move towards Sindhu on the right toward a field of wetness that asks the question how do you negotiate your way uh, to, uh, you know, to, to, create, uh, to create habitation. So, so from you know on the one side I mean so that was uh, that was streets then this is about low ground low ground over here you know you you know which is of course a messy surface that you then articulate in rivers and the drawing on the left has not come out that clearly but it's the rivers of all India actually that have been straightened and channeled um, and on the right you have a, a wetness that moves much more with buns and holding of uh, and, and, and holding systems um, you have walls that uh, that then then gather which which of course reveal uh, i mean on, on the one side move much more towards urbanity where we want to get rid of the mud mud walls and brick walls and we have started now moving into aluminum and uh, you know aluminum and uh, glass uh, structures and steel structures you know for rejecting rejecting wetness in its uh, you know for the sake of clarity and for the for the sake of form and on the on the right towards Sindhu, which is much more of an engaged uh, engaged surfacing, where you look at even walls, you look at the earth, you look at things as holding as holding grounds. Um, you know, talking about on the one hand going down rivers, you know, where we, we, we you know we constitute we constitute river fronts uh, in uh, you know in in India, and and that of course has its has its own complexities. We have constructed ecologies around rivers. We have constructed uh, you know sciences. I would say you know I mean. Um, uh, around around uh, rivers, um, and here on the right side is is an attempt as a first first step towards undoing that that whole uh, ground of being and knowledge uh, that um, you know and and resituating us in a field of in a field of uh, of, of wetness. Okay, I think I'm going to I'm going to end there and uh, uh, would appreciate any questions etc that uh, that uh, that you might have but if i may say one word about about delhi and and the yamuna uh, it would be it would be this i mean it is one thing to design the you know to see delhi as a city on a river which has which has constructed a history of you know the seven seven cities and and so on and so forth which is which is something that is so puzzling you know i mean i know chaya told us that story about uh, about uh, the, the making of amudabad and uh, you know, and uh, the, the idea, uh, there are these myths actually of the, of the constitution of, of, of cities and the seven, you know, Bombay, seven islands, here Delhi, seven cities, you know, we've, seven hills of Rome. I mean, there's something about the seven business that has been imported, you know, of, you know, from, you know, from Ptolemy's Septonesia, you know, where he, in the second century, he spoke about, he spoke about the seven islands, et cetera. And so we've, we've you know, we've, we've constructed our history of Delhi to be on a on on a river, and we call that river Yamuna. I want to suggest that Yamuna is a field of rain, you know, like the Ganga is a field of rain, and then ask the question: What does it mean to actually be in that in that realm of uh, of of wetness? And then what would it do to our politics? You know, maybe we are not as centralized as we should we should not be as centralized as we are. That that we are much more like raindrops that uh, that are uh, that are uh, you know across across the you know uh, Sindhu. Um, without any geographic boundaries, as it were, that are totally constructed by by a river landscape. Okay, so thank you very much for that. Thank you so much, Dilip. This was fantastic. Uh, can I ask everyone who is uh, listening, I apologize, I should have said this earlier, but you can type your questions into the Q&A. Um, so if you can please do that, that would be incredible. So um, I wanted to just, um, I wanted to tease out a few things in your talk that I've often uh, admired immensely through the years, but I've not heard you talk about it. Um, so it somehow seems to be uh, um, either assumed or a kind of a not very explicit uh, statement, but I'm interested in, um, among other things, I'm interested in the representations of wetness. 
And I think that as um, architects, landscape architects, as you suggested, if maps are fair weather constructs, which they are, um, then um, what are the tools, devices, modes, frames, methods um, of representing um, an ocean of wetness? Right. So I think that because because as soon as we start drawing lines, we immediately uh, sort of cause the problem. And then we, we you know, so if we if we didn't even um, because I think it, it's not just a question of representation, right? It's, it's a whole mental construct like you've like you made the case for. So um, I'm interested in in the really the, the tools of the designer uh, first in, in terms of uh, breaking these constructs, uh, these dualities between ground and water. But, but second, also then, once you represent it in a certain way, then it begs the question, how do you inhabit the, the, the landscape? So I think that, um, you know, any thoughts on that would be, would be great. <laughs> no, that's, a, that's an excellent question. It really gets to the heart of our work. And uh, let's say the heart of our challenge. And uh, I can't say that we've always uh, lived up to it. I mean, it's been, a, it's been an exploration. Uh, but we're coming to see more and more, see the representation, the act of representing is very much a professional act that has entered into the, into the field of, uh, of design uh, in order to extract design out of the common man's uh, 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 grip, as it were, in order to create a profession called architecture, you know, and, or, or landscape architecture or this thing. And so we are in then command. So it was. It is. Uh, maps are. Uh, are. Uh, um, you know, have inspired the need for representation of the ground, and this is why we are moving away from architecture as a representational profession to a practice to practices of everyday life and that people engage in, and 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 uh, habitation comes out of those practices. So so, on, what you see on the right. Is an attempt uh, is an attempt over here to to both challenge representation itself as a as a as a power tool by which we by which we uh, I would say disenfranchise uh, you know common people at the same time demonstrate the possibility of an analogous reading of wetness so the way we are engaging wetness on paper we suggest people actually do that in the world that they are engaging. So we are, so you will see that, I mean, in our work on Rajasthan, we are looking at the potters, we're looking at pottery, we're looking at fabric, we're looking at things. I mean, and these are people who are working with wetness in a particular way. I had a student, uh, you know, and he's now at Cornell, uh, Sarosh, uh, who is working on muslin as a, as a, as a, uh, um, a fabric that is dyed out precisely because it required wetness and that wetness is gone because we have we have now dried out the landscape literally and with that killed the cotton that was used actually in muslin but muslin needs that wetness in order for that fineness to be so these practices of wetness is what we are trying to do actually on the right so we are not trying to we are, we are both trying to represent but also get beyond representation by using it by invoking an analogous uh, idea and we hope that um, that and this is where architecture, uh, I move between wanting to get rid of it completely as a profession and, uh, you know, and wanting to rescue it in some manner. But, uh, but uh, I would say that there is, a, there is a desire on my part to say that, uh, that uh, we have to find other ways, you know, to, to engage and, uh, and work with, uh, with people in a, in a manner or, you know, otherwise we, we, we continue a colonial project that is 2,500 years old. Yeah. I don't know if I answered your question, Sarush, for the same. Thank you. That, that was, mm. yes. Uh, I guess these, these, these things don't have answers. They are uh, more important to ask the question than to find an answer, so to speak. So, um, well said. I, <laughs> I'm well said. going to ask uh, any of the other panelists, Professor Chaya. Yeah, <clears throat> Dilip, thank you very much for this hugely exciting mode of thought thinking. I'm going to revert to type and think like an architect. Um, and it seemed to me that 
what the absence of the line, the absence of the skin, the absence of separation imply is a kind of variegated texture or a kind of porous existence which um, modifies itself or becomes modified by some human practices but it is a kind of texture it's a kind of porous medium the world suppose if i think of it as a porous medium and then then it seems to me that perhaps the settlement is a kind of sponge um, so that, that is why it takes such a such an ununderstandable uh, shape uh, when we look at the plans of, of uh, man-made settlements where not much power was being imposed, where not clarity was being imposed, then we see crooked lines, we see all kinds of little bubbles of space and we see a porosity. And it seems to me that this whole notion of wetness could be one whole method of re-describing architecture of people who are not interested in imposing power. And I think this is a wonderful device with which to look at Delhi as well, or, or the space in which we are working in this studio yeah. as something yeah. which, is a, which is the opposite of clarity, but is the yeah. sense of, of porosity, the sense yeah. of sponginess which is, yeah. which is uh, really important. Uh, I, no, uh, I'd like to know your views on that. <laughs> no, I mean, that, uh, beautifully said, uh, Chai. I mean, I think that that is, that is precisely to some extent, I think what, uh, what we want to do. And it'd be lovely actually to work with you guys actually on, that, on precisely that. Uh, you know, we did this for Bangalore. I mean, in, in the case of Bangalore, which, you know, of course is marketed as a garden city. We said it's not a garden, it's neither a garden nor a city. You know, and that, uh, and that it was, you know, we invoked, uh, we invoked concepts, uh, you know, that, and for those of you who are from Karnataka, will understand uh, Tota as a, as a, you know, it's often translated as garden, but it is much more of a, of a, you know, a, a feel like agricultural situation that, um, that really worked with rain and worked with, worked with uh, systems. I mean, as you call it sponginess. You know, and the only, why, only reason why I don't like to use the word sponge is that it's often used with sponge city. You know, it's become a, it's become a, a phrase, like sponge city. And I, and I don't want to associate the city, you know, with the sponge. As you, you also sort of, sort of in, in some sense, uh, walk back on even the notion of Delhi. I mean, if I'd use the name Delhi, you know, for a place, like I use the name Bangalore for a place that then is open to investigation outside of the concept and framework of a city, you know, on a river or a city that on a surface, but much more in this realm that you beautifully described, I mean, think as, as a sponge, you begin to, you know, you work a sponge much more in a relative situation of wetness, you know, of softness, of, uh, you know, hardness and so on. And I think that it's a very apt description and the ground for what you would like to call, and this is in my moments of, uh, my moments of gratitude to my profession, want to rescue architecture in this manner, I think, as you rightly described it. And which is what we have done in Bangalore, we did in Bombay. So in Bombay, our, our book Soak, Mumbai and an estuary, really spoke about what is it to see an island versus seeing an estuary. And seeing an estuary is much more the sponge metaphor that you use uh, as opposed to an island, which is very much a planned representational view of, of a thing. So, Concepts like the Maidan, which is very much a Delhi, it's a world in Delhi and much of, I mean, all over India, you know, like the Sabarmati. I say the Sabarmati is a Maidan, and, but I don't see it confined by two lines. I see Ahmedabad on the Maidan. I see the, all of Ahmedabad on the Maidan. I see, you know, the, you know, the Maidan that is open to, open to water at some time. It's open to goats at another time. It's open to the Gujari at another time and, and so on and so forth. And I find this across India. The Maidan is something that, uh, that is much more of a sponge world, belongs in the sponge world. And, and so we invoked it in Bombay as part of a sponge world rather than, uh, you know, as opposed to the park. And the same thing in Bangalore with the Tota, we invoked it as a sponge in a world of a Maidan as opposed to the world of, um, uh, the, world of the garden 
and the controlled garden and this thing, which is very much a thing. So that I, I really appreciate your your question and challenge and comment actually in terms of resituating architecture and uh, resituating Delhi in this um, in this um, you know sponginess, let's say you know of uh, an ocean of wetness. Yeah, yeah. So. Um... I don't know, it, maybe there are questions among the panelists and there's a whole bunch of questions here. Um, I had uh, one, if I could, if, if I could go. Uh, yeah, I think uh, a lot of your presentation also kind of uh, explains why uh, the settlements in Delhi move towards the river at a later time. Initially, they are away from the river. Uh, but I had another thought and this comes from a, a spiritual leader in the south of India who says that the, the two kinds of thinking, one is, let's say, intellect and the other is perhaps wisdom. And the intellect is really born out of a sense of or in, instinct of survival and a preservation of the body. And in some ways, uh, the distinction between what the body is inside and what is outside is created for that sense of instinctual uh, instinct of preservation, because the body is also respirating and transpiring continuously. And so there is no limit of the body in that sense. Um, the, the question I was going to ask you was, do you, do you think that there is a priority that wetness holds over dryness? Because in Delhi, there are also extended spells of dust storms, and in which case there is no real difference between the soil and the earth, uh, soil and the air. The soil and the air continuously are also in a process of getting mixed and intermixed. So, uh, yeah. No, I mean I think that that's a that's a, that's a, that's a, a valid. You know, one of the things that uh, that we are at pains to say is you know that uh, that that in Delhi, I mean you know when I was there in in, in the eighties, one 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 of the memories that are stuck in my this thing is a dust storm, but the dust storm that brought the smell of rain, you know I mean it was it was one of the most remarkable. Uh, you know, they call it Petrica over here. They call it, I mean, that's the, the smell of rain, the, the, you know, and, and I tell you, it was one of the most pleasurable uh, feelings. Um, but the sense actually that uh, wetness is everywhere, um, you know, it's a, it comes down to a kind of, I would say, non-dualistic approach. Uh, and in terms of philosophy, what uh, in my smatterings, I would say, and engagements with it, uh, particularly in Western philosophy, um, I find that, uh, you know, the whole urge uh, move, I would say, or, or uh, toward non-dualism has always been on the surface of a, of a divided earth, you know, of a land and water. So there, in other words, what I say is before philosophy, there is geography, you know, and, and uh, whereas what you're talking about perhaps is, is the wisdom comes from outside of geography. It does, not, it does not have geography as a mediating ground. So, you know, someone like, uh, someone like um, Alfred uh, North Whitehead, you know, said, you know, made this famous statement that uh, all philosophy is a footnote to Plato. You know, what I say is that, foot, uh, that Plato was a footnote to the school of Miletus, you know, to Thales and the school of Miletus, because his philosophy is grounded on an earth's surface. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, the whole idea of the individual, the skin encapsulated being, the, the thing, I mean, even in those descriptions of a skin encapsulated being, like the skin encapsulated city, the skin encapsulated uh, things that we, they were, comes from a reactionary mode to geography, you know, and, and I would think that, uh, that we can bypass that uh, assertion and start with uh, a non-dualism that is grounded in wetness, that does not, it does not, have a dryness. It just is a relatively less wet situation, you know. And so, you know, so the dust in the 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 thing of Rajasthan, you know, we talk about it as dust storms coming from Rajasthan. We don't talk about inhabiting the dust, you know, and finding wetness in it, you know, in a the thing, which is what uh, you know many people did uh, with uh, the Kanat system and Dew and you know and so on. Yeah. But, uh, but it's an interesting challenge that in your, in your, your, your wording of your question, I think that I feel we have to change our whole approach to wisdom, um, you know, and that uh, wisdom can bypass philosophy in a way, because philosophy is the handmaid of geography. 
Thank I you. know that's a little bolder than I wanted it to come out, but. Uh, <laughs> yes, he has another question. May I actually pick on something uh, Sudipto alluded to when he was talking about the seven cities of Delhi uh, and them getting closer to the river. Uh, something that has uh, uh, that I have noticed in uh, settlements across the country, and this doesn't matter whether it's on a river or by the sea. Uh, it seems that the sponge or the or, or, or the, the the settlement as it is turns its back to uh, water as it is defined by a river or a tank or a, a lake. So I, I mean, whether you whether you find a fishing village in Alibagh or you find, say, the city of Ahmedabad, which in some sense uh, formally turns its back to what we would call the Maidan of the, the Sabarmati. I'm wondering if you have any observations or any kind of uh, understanding of the positions we take uh, with respect to relative uh, wetness, to extremes or various degrees that are articulated uh, you know, in the process as a kind of vocabulary for our, our inhabitation. I don't know. I just... Uh, thought maybe yeah. I could ask that. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. I've never thought about approaching it as, as, as you have. Um, you know, it is a challenge. I mean, because we tend to see, we tend to see settlements as holes, as holes. And the, the, the beauty actually of, of um, you know, of, of Sindhu and, and its demands or the sponge and the, the, the critical zone and its sponge and uh, et cetera, other metaphors that we can use. Um, is that there is no front or back, but that is also very, it's, it's very local. It's very local. Mm. And, and that sense of locality and uh, thing, I, I don't like to use the term only because it comes with global, you know, it comes with, a, it comes always with an other. Unfortunately, we have to change our, the language itself is sometimes limiting. But this, but the sense of wanting to see a whole is then, you know, comes with wanting to see a front. And I know it is replicated even at, even at a house. We have a front of a house and a back of a house, you know, a backyard and a front yard. I mean, these are concepts that are all introductions, you know, by, by you know, I mean, I would think facelifters, you know, people who, people who have, uh, you know, constructed us in this, um, in this sort of framework that, um, that uh, you know, with a front side and a back side. Um, and, um, and I think it, I feel it is like another, it's another uh, version, I would think, of uh, of what we were talking about earlier. You know, and even even in your description of turning the back to the Sabarmati, for example, uh, or it, and now of course trying to create a front, trying to make the Sabarmati the front, is a is a geographic articulation that is you know literally seen from the sky above, uh, and uh, and that's why I like to see the Sabarmati. You know, when I, when people say, you know, or when I learned that Gandhi gathered on the Sabarmati, you know, I would like to think that his resistance, his resistance was not merely actually to, uh, to the British who had told him that he cannot gather in public places and that he, and so he found, he found the river as outside of the public private uh, divisions. I wouldn't like to think of it like that. I would like to think that Gandhi, what Gandhi was saying is that by gathering on the Sabarmati, the Sabarmati is the ground of India. You know, and the Sabarmati as the ground is 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 something that is non-dualistic. It it does not have an other. So you don't create Sabarmati is not a river that then is adjacent to a city. Sabarmati is the freedom of India, you know, which I'm calling Sindhu. But that that sensibility of the Sabarmati at the of the Maidan uh, as uh, as being uh, unbound, you know. So to come back to your question, I, I think this, this notion of uh, uh, the front and back is a, is a good one to tackle in design. Uh, I think through the local, through very much to the, the personal, I mean, and then you begin to, to create a new uh, thing. Because this is what we did in, in, in Bangalore also, you know, instead of, we, we, we did it as an intersection of trajectories. Um, and uh, you know, and it becomes it becomes another it becomes another situation. An intersection of trajectories is very different from seeing cities. You know, you begin to see practices that uh, construct trajectories. 
you know and um, absolutely um yeah. it, it's it, this is great because also uh, speaking of sabarmati and and gandhi we have a question here but i just wanted to say that uh, it's also a like you've said repeatedly it's also a question of of nomenclature and naming because rivers imply water whereas the sabarmati was not water most of the year it was not water back in the day when it didn't hadn't become a pond and um and and it was in fact practices it was absolutely practices there you know henry cartier bresson has documented these beautifully and anyone who's lived in the city at the time knew that the river was just a receptacle or a place for for practices or the sabarmati was better than calling it a river so uh, divya shri dubey has a question here um imagining geography without banks and embankments and every other boundary and line that we've created assumes that we let go of the anthropocentric idea of design and development if i may use the term um it comes close to gandhi swaraj for me so your thoughts on that i'm sorry uh, saroj could so, you so that question so imagining geography without banks and embankments and every other boundary and line that we've created assumes that we let go of an anthropocentric idea of design and development and this um for divya comes close to gandhi swaraj um yeah <laughs> what would you think of that <laughs> yeah i mean i i was sort of puzzled with the question because it 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 sort of yeah i mean i i would call it reimagining geography because you know it's 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 reimagining it's reimagining habitation uh, without geography uh, to begin with but uh, but yes i mean i would think that Uh, i mean i think the point that we are making about gandhi and the sabarmati i think answers that that question i i and i think it's a very good sentiment that you have uh divya but i think it is um, it really does speak to that I and mean, i think uh, the way i would see it is that it is swaraj you know that gandhi's appreciation i mean and i took that i take that one moment act where he began the salt march in the sabarmati uh, you know and uh, that gathering to me is a moment of of free of of a free ground actually of habitation you know and uh, and you so could look are, into that yeah there are mm. two conceits here and maybe they are not very cleanly related one is of course gandhi but the other one is uh, a non anthropocentric habitation of the world so yeah. sort of breaking these lines perhaps alludes to yeah. some uh, extent yeah. of non anthropocentric yeah. i don't know if Absolutely. you have thoughts on that okay no i mean it's what we uh, and this is something i'm i'm uh, questioning as well the only thing is i don't have the wherewithal and that is why we constructed this platform called ocean of wetness in order to reconstitute uh, the way in which we look at our fellow inhabitants uh, we look at our fellow inhabitants to classification schemes so and here i'm taking i'm taking uh, professor chaya's uh, lead here in uh, in looking at ourselves as inhabitants and the question is inhabitants of what you know and uh, and and i think that changes the way in which we we see our our uh, our fellow in abd it works both ways you know changing the ground we have to so we have to rearticulate literally rearticulate uh, much of uh, much of what science has been teaching us in terms of uh, in terms of our fellow our fellow beings and uh, so i think there is an intrinsic uh, i would say you call it non anthropocentric i call it sometimes ecocentric um but um, urge i would think to uh, uh, in in sindhu definitely yeah so gandhi swaraj and uh, gandhi swaraj as well as uh, as well as our as well as ecocentrism i think they roll wonderfully um uh, sort of fit in i feel with uh, with our with ocean of wetness or sindhu maybe we have time for a couple more questions um so how does the there is ishita here so how does the idea of understanding the city ness through its intensities and flows help uh, if they do to project uh, dynamics of representation is there a merit in representing um documenting to that which is a potential rather than that which is Uh, would perhaps representations uh, then become speculative rather than preservative, which I think oh, also your work does. Your work sort of begins with a certain kind of documentation, but at some point it totally destabilizes the project, which I guess is the yeah. whole point of the. 
I think the only, the only, uh, I mean, I would agree with that question very much. I mean, I would say, but I wouldn't call it silliness. You know, I mean, I would call it the, the, the practices, the practices of living. Uh, and I mean, I think this goes back to your first exercise on time, you know, and, um, you know, what time is this place? Um, and um, I think, you know, I mean, to some extent, there are two times. What I'm talking about, the time of Sindhu is very different. I mean, I'm talking about here in the moment of the hydrologic cycle. That is why I sort of look at rain as an initiation. And so then I talk about driving in the moment of the hydrologic cycle in all the various moments. So I, I transform and you will find that all the practices in India actually work with accommodating rain, accom accommodating less rain, accommodating. And, but we have been educated to see this as a city of dryness and or, or, you know, seasons of dryness and so on. But if you talk about, if you talk about variations in that mode and living with that, uh, living with that uh, cycle, automatically your documentation of place becomes uh, significant, I would think. So, you know, in, in what, what you saw in the last, or even the slide that is up on the screen, uh, if you still have it, you know, it, the movement towards, uh, toward India is one, is a documentation that is of a particular kind. And we move toward plots that you see on the left side. You know, where you extract rivers, where you extract species, where you extract, uh, you know, uh, moving rivers and you, you know, migrations, you know, because you have held land still. But if you are documenting toward the right where there's nothing that holds still, but that you are all the time negotiating, your act of documentation itself is an act of negotiation. So I would encourage you actually to look at your documentation, not as an objective exercise of recording uh, you know, um, prior, you know, inhabitants, but documentation as a way of constituting habitation. Uh, it becomes a very different, uh, different uh, mode of uh, uh, working. I mean, this is what we did. I mean, if you're interested in looking at our Bombay work, where we documented, how we documented and how we bring the documentation together is going back to Sarosha's first question is both an attempt at, at, uh, at representing something different, but also getting beyond representation. Thank you so much. Okay, one, one last question and then we'll let you go because it's been, it's been a long morning. Uh, it's, we're closing in on one and a half hours here. Um, mm -hmm. so, um, so there's a question here on shifting scales and uh, moving perhaps more toward built scales. So uh, thank you for the amazing talk. I want to ask you, this is Anna Dare. Uh, I wanna ask you about the idea of wetness on another scale within the built environment. You talked about lines um, uh, and in school, they always say when you begin drawing walls, uh, you are actually, um, they are, walls are not actually drawn as lines. You must draw in fact, two lines to represent the thickness of a wall but also for it to be correct. Therefore, we have gotten used to drawing not only the line where the ground and water split, but also where wetness is allowed and not allowed into our interior spaces. Can you speak a bit more about how as architects we could go beyond this to include wetness within the built environment beyond the wall? Yeah, you know, <laughs> this, I mean, it's, a, it's an excellent question actually, because you know, to some extent wetness has no scale. You know, I mean, and the whole notion of scale is a very geographic, uh, you know, the ancients uh, looked at uh, geography, but they, but they distinguished between geography, choreography, and topography as three different scales of engagement. You know, topography was a unit, uh, you know, choreography was place, and uh, geography was the earth, you know? And, um, and so, so as architects, we fit very much to some extent at that. Uh, uh, I would encourage you to get out of scale. In, you know, to, and I, I know that that is, that is extremely difficult. Uh, and that is why, again, if I had to point to what is on the screen and what I think, I always play both sides. You know, I, I, since I'm educated into architecture, um, I, I, look at, I look at what this is doing for me, and then I look to see how I can release myself from this, from this uh, burden of architectural education. So there's learning and there's unlearning, you know, and, but there is experiment, so likely, like, like you say, it's speculation. It, it is certainly a speculative, uh, much more speculation, I would say, than, uh, than empirical, uh, you know, sort of experiment, if you will. But, uh, but I think that that is already a wonderful observation that you have made from moving from one line to two lines, you know, and that it is not between inside and outside, but that it is a porosity, as, uh, as Chaya spoke about it. 
you know, I think uh, in that earlier question, you know, it's porosity, that uh, thing. And so the way I look at it is, I then start looking at inhabiting the wall, you know, and then if I say, I, I don't inhabit the space inside, I inhabit the wall. And then I, I make the wall into my ground of habitation, you know, and it becomes this, you know, so it doesn't end at the skin on one side and the skin on the other side, it actually, so this is one way in which uh, we have dealt with the coastline. And uh, in our project on Norfolk in Virginia, what we, what we did was we said, uh, you know, we, we, we spoke about turning the coast. We said that instead of, instead of looking at a coastline between land and sea, why don't we look at fingers of high ground? And fingers of high ground that turn toward the sea like this, you know? So, so instead, of, instead of this, you know, to one and two, I'm talking about this now, extending into the sea and extending the ground. You, you create gradients that, are, that, are, that have no end. So I would like to see the wall like that. The wall also, you know, could become an act of where, where you begin design in a moment of initiation. So the wall is an initiation that then, that then moves to break this boundary between India. So you must be cautious and not to see the, not to see the wall thickness um, as, a, as, you know, as a riparian zone or a thickened line. Uh, so I think what you said as a you know, single line to a double line, and I would say beyond lines, you know what I mean, and and uh, thing, and so it becomes a it becomes a starting point of of design. And I truly believe, actually, that that people lived with this when they constructed a mud wall, you know, when they constructed a wall, they did not create an inside and outside that that you know that qualifies as architecture. They actually worked a practice by which they could they could extend. The, the 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 wall was their inhabited uh, ground. I don't know if I'm sort of answering your question, but I find a wonderful starting point of design in what you said. Um, you know, from a single to a double line, and then thing, which is something that we have used ourselves. Like you said, like I said in our Norfolk project, of course, at a very different scale. Um, but yeah. So Sudipta is requesting one last thing. We, we we're not going to let you go. You're going to have to literally hang up, and disconnect <laughs> on us. Uh, we, would like to, <laughs> we would like to we would like you to zoom zoom into the beautiful drawings on the right hand side please if that's possible mm -hmm. uh just the the little yeah. maps on the right hand side shall i shall i uh, let me do if you could uh, just zoom in one. with uh, powerpoint yeah, yeah. Uh, is that uh is that coming onto your screen? I think yes, yeah. but I, I think yeah. so. Were you talking about the next, the last page, or yeah. I'll let I, you I think, speak? Yeah, I think it's. Oh, those are wonderful as well. But I was talking about oh. the last slide, fifty number. Oh, 55. the last slide. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me get. To... Yeah, these are wonderful as well. Yeah. Yeah, this is our. I think I think this is about the maximum I can go in in, in power. <laughs> but you know this is this is something that I mean this um, they're they're still working on the exhibit uh, on the website. It's opened in it's opened in uh, Germany, in uh, uh, in Karlsruhe in Germany. But uh, they the the website is going to open shortly. I think and you'll be able to zoom into thing. But it's exactly. Um, we made it respond to Sudipto's uh, sort of urge of wanting to wanting to go in. Um, but we really look at these as the kind of starts of engagement, and uh, at some point we had to call a stop to it. But um, much more a discrete mode of settlement, uh, rather than rather than a continuous riverfront. And so that is what we were, you know, and the uh, uh, and uh, holdings. Yeah. So you know, if it's yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so speaking of. Uh, at some point, putting a stop to it. Uh, all good things must come to an end. And really, thank you again. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your enthusiasm for giving this talk and being available to do it. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, I appreciate it. I mean, thank I, you I all to the say, participants. Yeah. No, thank you very much also for, for have inviting me. And I, I would, uh, I mean, I just want to say that I appreciate what you guys are undertaking. I think it's a, it's a significant. 
it's something significant. I mean, someone needs to challenge uh, the, this, this paradigm. And, and I love the way in which you started, in a sense, and even the first exercise of what time is this place. I think so it sort of sounds at, at face uh, Kevin Lynch's question, but I think it goes further. Um, at least I, I noticed in the discussion was already going further. So um, there's, there's a lot there. And I would love to know where you guys take it all. But, uh, but it's been a pleasure. It's a, been a pleasure talking to you eh? and pleasure seeing you, you know, Professor Chaya particularly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye.